welcome everyone. This is the fifth class for the IBIS Prep MBE crash course for the July 2023 bar exam. And we're continuing today talking about torts. And one thing in particular is people are asking me, how do they submit their assignments onto the drive? And everyone should have their own folder, but they weren't exactly sure of what they uh, should submit. So I wanted to start off by showing everyone an example, right? If you go on, let's say you have Adaptabar and you could have any program. If you go to subject and then it'll give you this little performance thing and then you could go to view PDF. And then if you click the view PDF, it should come up. It might do a pop-up blocker, but yeah. This PDF right here is exactly what you should submit. It tells me how you're doing by subject, whatever, whatever, and you know we can work on it. So that's um, the best thing for submitting your assignments. Like I said, 25 questions per day minimum, um, ideally, 4,000 questions by the end of the program. That's an 800 question per week um, goal. So 800 questions per week is a lot. Um, do you submit the Q&A? Yeah, you can submit the Q&A as well. You don't have to, but I really just wanna see that you're doing um, your appropriate number of questions. And trust me, if your scores are low right now, this is a process, it's an improvement process. No one is supposed to have a passing score today. You're supposed to get to a passing score on test day. So just trust the process and do the number of questions and then um, we'll work on it. And if you're totally behind and you're not there, you know, we can help with uh, tutoring. Um, for those who adapt to before, do we only submit month of May or everything? Um, you, can, you can do it by month, that's, that's fine. You could do it by month. If you were doing questions before May, I don't, I'm not really concerned with questions you are doing before May. I'd like to see it for May, June, and July. Um, if you are doing it on another program, just figure out a way to do a PDF that is similar or a doc, or even if you just handwrite it, or if you write it in document, I just want to know how many questions you've done total and what is your percentage correct by subject. That's the best way for me to stay on top of people. I'm everyone's friend here. I want everyone to pass. So if I see things that are a little bit concerning, I'll reach out and say, hey, or Alexis or Jesse or James will reach out and we'll say, hey, you know, we really think that you could use some more help in this subject and, and we'll make that happen. So we're doing torts um, uh, today. And as we know, torts is um, a subject that we can do really well in, unlike uh, contracts or civil procedure or real property, there's not all these different um, exceptions and intricacies. It's more about just knowing the different types of torts. Um, in one of our recordings that we did on Sunday, Matt and I went over this entire MBE torts questionnaire and I put that in the drive. So, you know, just quickly to go over and not go over, but just look at the points on it. There's an entire video that's on the drive that Matt and I uh, go over in detail as you know, we think about together. But just to remember what's tested and this will help you on MBE torts questions, intentional torts. What is the necessary element? Intent. It's not about whether a reasonable person would have done it, it's whether you had the intent to do it. And we've always been focused on memorizing intentional torts. We have assault, battery, false imprisonment, trespass to land, trespass to chattels, conversion, intentional infliction of emotional distress, intentional misrepresentation, intentional interference with the business relationship, we have the privacy torts, which could be intrusion upon seclusion, disclosure, appropriation or misappropriation, and false light. We could also have defamation because certain times that requires intent. We could have um, malicious prosecution or even uh, a nuisance could have elements of intent. Um, I even saw on an MBE question, intentional endangerment. So we're just stretching it out, but I've never seen that as the correct answer. But those are all the different torts. And I want everyone to at least feel comfortable that you can name all the intentional torts so that you know that intent is necessary for those torts. And then that you understand negligence and different types of negligence, whether it be premise liability or whether it be um, duty, uh, causation, breach, and damages. 
um, and the different types of causation. You definitely need to know negligence well, and you need to know all the different types of torts. So what are the intentional torts? Assault and battery. Assault is throwing the punch, battery is landing it, right? You have the intent to cause imminent harmful contact with assault, and then battery is actually that harmful contact. The transferred intent doctrine, remember, intent can transfer either from person to person or from tort to tort. So if you intend to commit assault, but you actually commit battery, then the intent that you had for assault will actually be sufficient to constitute the intent necessary for battery, right? So if you throw the punch, but you didn't mean to hit him, but then it lands, that's battery, even though you only had the intent for assault. So too, if you intend to commit assault and battery upon Johnny, but you miss Johnny and actually hit Tommy, that's gonna also be assault and battery because the intent that you had to assault or to commit battery upon um, Tommy will transfer appropriately to Johnny. So we have assault, battery, and we have the transfer intent doctrine. False imprisonment, intentional confinement of another against their will, and remember the shopkeeper privilege, which is um, you have a right to detain someone for a reasonable amount of time just to figure out if they stole something, or even potentially if they're acting a fool in the bar and they're, you know, swinging uh, beer bottles at people. You can lock them up in the, in the kitchen for, until they sober up, right? There's a reasonable element here for the privilege of false imprisonment. IIED, the intentional, outrageous, causes actual harm. The defendant should have known that the harm will result. We're looking at incredibly ridiculous behavior. An example is painting racial epithets on your neighbor's home, right? You knew that that was uh, outrageous behavior and it was intentional and it was going to cause harm. Remember, you'll see NIED versus IIED. It's important to see if it was intentional or whether it was negligent. Um, can a tortfeasor be liable for IIED to persons other than the intended target? And then we said, yes, if there's a special specific relationship between them. So if they actually witness it and they're a close family member, then they could also recover under an IID claim. Um, trespass to land, the intrusion upon the property of another. It could be the person themselves who you know, walks onto the property, or it could be throwing a rock onto the property, something like that, or just causing something else to intrude upon the property. Um, is a person still liable for trespass to land if he was unaware he was on someone else's land? Yes, the intent is all that matters. If I'm walking on Tommy's property and I think it's my property, it doesn't matter, right? Because I had the intent to walk on the land, whether I knew whose land it was or not is irrelevant. Um, cool. Is a person still liable for trespass to land if he uh, didn't actually cause any damage? I hear said, yes, definitely. I mean, uh, you're liable for nominal damages, right? You committed trespass. Then the question is not asking how much should he pay in damages. It's saying, is he liable for trespass? So we don't even need to get into the damages discussion. Um, sometimes with damages, we'll have a privilege. I mean, sometimes a trespass will have a privilege. Like if you're a boater and there's a storm and you put your boat up on the dock, well, you're allowed to do that because it was a crazy storm and you know your boat was going to suffer too much damages. But then once the storm passes, you have to leave. If the person unties your boat and it gets damaged, <clears throat> they'll be responsible for the damage to your boat because you had a privilege to be docked there. If you dock your boat <clears throat> on somebody's property or on someone's dock and cause damage to their dock, even though you had the privilege, you'll still be liable for the actual damages to their dock because it was a private necessity. The only time you won't be liable for the actual damages is if it was a public necessity and you know you were saving the people or something like that. Maybe you're a bus driver, public school bus driver, something like that. Okay, what are the elements of trespass of chattels and of conversion, what's the difference? Trespass of chattels is borrowing for longer than allowed or using a chattel without permission, right? Taking something for a joyride. But you have to interfere with that person's use of it. You have to actually take it. If someone just walks up and pets your dog and know in this very sensitive society we live in, you would like to claim trespass of chattels, that's not gonna prevail. That's just someone petting your dog. Maybe you could prevail on some other thing like IIED, they knew that you were gonna be sensitive to it, but you're not gonna be able to prevail on trespass of chattels because you didn't interfere with their use of the dog. You have to like 
take their car out for a little ride. Now, we just did a question, a, a student of mine and I just did a question where you take the car out for 20 minutes and you're allowed to. Your friend said you could take it out, but then you drive it all the way across town, 100 miles away, and you get an accident for $3,000. And the question asks, what can you recover in conversion action? Well, the answer there is the complete amount, right? The complete amount of the uh, car, which in this case was $12,000. Because if it's ever conversion, you're entitled to the complete amount. That's what conversion means. Um, conversion is the fair market value. Yes, exactly, Scarlett. The fair market value is what conversion means. Um, Andrew, sorry, I have a quick question about number seven. Go ahead. If so if they don't know they're in someone else's land, how do they have intent? Um, I'm trying to see who's asking that question. Who is this? Isa. Oh, Isa, okay. So they had the intent to, to step, to throw the rock, right? Just because they didn't know it was someone else's property, it's not the intent to um, uh, trespass, it's the intent to commit the act that constitutes trespass, right? Um, so you stepped on the person's property thinking it was your property. You didn't intend to step on someone else's property, but you did step on someone else's property. That's trespass. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a lot of that is with intent. It's not always the intent to, you know, complete whatever it is. It's just the general intent to do the thing that has a substantial certainty that the event would incur. Exactly. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Oh, of course. Um, so what are the invasions of privacy and what are their elements? So intrusion upon seclusion, I always go with peeping Tom. I feel so bad for the original Tom. I mean, I don't feel bad for him. He probably really deserved this, but you know, that moniker really stuck. <laughs> See, all right, thank you for laughing, UJ. I need, some, I need to know my jokes are hidden. Okay, so intrusion upon seclusion is, um, you're looking in somebody's window, very creepy, very punishable. Disclosure, public revelations of private information, right? Public disclosure of private information. Uh, false light is different from defamation because it can be true, but it's misleading. So uh, my state, for instance, Florida doesn't recognize a separate tort for false light, but on the MBE, they may have that tort, false light. Appropriation or misappropriation of likeness. I think we wrote Mickey Mouse because we were saying like, you know, if you use a mouse that's just like Mickey, but you don't have the rights to it, then that would be appropriation or misappropriation. Um, EJ is doing his NIL class or his team is doing the NIL class. I'm sure that's a big issue in NIL, appropriation, misappropriation, people trying to use like a uh, Ronnie James. He's going to be a big, big name in that industry. All right. What are the elements of defamation? I mean, this is very short and sweet. We'll go over more detail, but a false statement stated about another to a third person that caused damages, right? So it's the dissemination um, to a third person of uh, defamatory information that cause damages. There's some types of defamation that don't cause damages as we see right here, um, club, right? If it's per se, crimes of moral turpitude, loathsome disease, unchastity and about someone's business. So be careful on an MBE question. They'll sneak that in there and they'll say like, you know, Andrew said that Tommy um, is a crook, is a thief. That's a crime of moral turpitude. Andrew said that Brittany is a floozy. Um, that's a word that I don't think people use anymore, but that means like, you know, uh, unchastity. If, you know, we get this. The, the ones that they sneak in are like the business and the crimes. You know, you don't really think, oh, he just said, you know, Andrew's tutoring business is, is lame. Yeah, well, that's defamation per se, buddy. <laughs> okay. Um, what are the special defenses to defamation? Does it matter whether it's written or uh, spoken? So, um, Let's just back up a little bit. Written defamation is libel, but it doesn't have to be written. It could be a radio, it could be television. It just means broadcast and that it's like recorded, you know, so that you can like go back and see the transcript of it. Slander is spoken, that's a bigger definition. A great defense to defamation is truth. If you say, you know, John Wilkes Booth was a murderer, that's a very true statement. That's not defaming him in any way. Um, if you know, I guess consent is usually a uh, defense to pretty much everything, all intentional towards if you consent to it. Um, truth is the big one. Make sure you're looking for truth. It doesn't matter if it's written or spoken. And 
we were talking about this privilege if you're a congressman. I think that's getting to the speech and debate clause. Don't worry, that's foreshadowing con, con law. We'll, we'll leave that out for now. Um, does it matter if you're a person to fame is public or private? Absolutely. If you're private, the standard is only negligence. If you're a public figure, the standard is malice. You have to have you know, said the statement knowing that it was a lie. So, you know, look for the fact pattern. They'll say, Tommy, a uh, senator, well, he's a, um, a public figure, so it has to have actual malice when he said it. Um, what are the elements of tortious interference with the contract or business relationship? Intentional act that induces another to breach a contract. There must be a contract. They must be aware of the contract. They must induce them to breach, and there must be actual harm. Hey, if any of you guys get a phone call from your university and they're talking about using a different company, you know, give my legal team a call. They might be inducing you to do something, and that might not be cool. Just a thought. Um, what are special defenses to the tort of interference? Um, so intentional interference, um, no damages, right? Just like uh, misrepresentation, that's a good one. Interference with a business relationship and um, uh, misrepresentation, there needs to be damages. You'll see that question where they misrepresented the house, they said it was XYZ and it really was ABC. They got the house and the market value was the same. There's actually no claim there on the misrepresentation. Um, number 14, is it defamation or slander per se? Um, it's, it's known as slander per se, but they also recognize libel per se in a lot of jurisdictions. So that's a fair question. But slander per se is more commonly seen. But if you see on the test a libel per se, it's also recognized in most jurisdictions. Um, and statute of limitations. Yeah, statute of limitations is always a good defense to any tort, really. You can't just bring things up super late. Um, what are the elements of intentional fraudulent misrepresentation? intentionally deceiving another by fraudulently representing a material fact, right? Um, just in general, on contracts, on torts, on the MBE, if someone acts totally in bad faith and, you know, deceitfully, they're not going to recover. So what are various defenses to intentional torts? <laughs> Note there are a lot. Consent, public and private necessity, privileges such as the shopkeeper privilege or necessary to prevent a crime, Self-defense, defense of a third party, defense of property, and statute of limitations. Those are good answers. Um, what's the difference between a private and a public necessity? Does it matter? Private, the benefit is to a private person, and you're liable for the actual damages. Public, the benefit is to the public, and you're not liable for the damages. We talked about that earlier with the, you know, the bus driver versus the private boat owner. Um, what's the difference between public and private nuisance? Public nuisance is annoying to everyone. And as Barbara made sure we all knew, the claim is not brought by the um, uh, public defender. It's brought by probably the attorney general. In her words, the public defender doesn't care about public nuisances. Um, but that's when it's annoying to everyone. You know, it's like someone, if there's uh, some company that's flying these drones over, it's just like a total public nuisance. The attorney general will step in and say, hey, you got to stop that. A private nuisance is you and your neighbor. And um, I'm sure this happens all the time. Now, on the MBE, always look out for special sensitivities. Um, yeah, Barbara says they defend the people committing the torts, right? Not the one, not the government. So uh, special sensitivities. If, you know, it's something during the daytime and you sleep during the day because of your job, you're nocturnal, you have a special sensitivity and then you cannot claim um, uh, a private nuisance. It has to be annoying to the general public. And then malicious prosecution, intentionally prosecuting just to cause harm to someone without a valid underlying claim. We could also see that, you know, the, in the courtroom, it might be uh, frivolous. You know, you could be subject to uh, some sort of, <clears throat> of uh, damages for wasting the court's time. So anyway, does anyone have any questions about intentional torts? Torts is a lot better than contracts. I think everyone will agree. You just need to know the torts. And then when you're reading the fact pattern, just think what tort is being tested here. You know, there's one fact pattern. It's the plane and the drunk guy on the plane, you know, uh, punches someone. And then they ask the question in multiple ways. Is there battery on behalf of the airline? No, the airline didn't commit battery. 
is there negligence on behalf of the airline potentially because maybe the airline had a duty to move the person after they noticed him being belligerent you know make sure you're reading the call of the question to know what tort is is being tested or if the answers are torts you know consider them make sure you know the torts but i really believe if you know the intentional torts you can be very good at answering torts questions because you just have to see are the elements satisfied they definitely test defamation um, assault battery they certainly test um you know there's one thing about like the cigarette smoke and what's the important question the question is whether um the cigarette smoke has the uh properties necessary to constitute battery like whether you know it's not whether it's reasonable to blow smoke in someone's face it has to be intent you're looking at intent for assault battery false imprisonment ied trespass to land trespass to chattels conversion um privacy torts these are all going to be intentional no questions about any anything about intentional torts cool i, like I do that. have one i have it. one it's just deal it's just really dealing with these invasion of privacy torts like the false light i'm just trying to get on it's exactly what it says it is very similar in multiple questions um you're a little bit i can't really hear you're like underwater but False light is a little bit different from defamation, but it doesn't have to be untrue, right? A defamatory statement is an untrue statement. Uh, casting someone in a false light is, um, there can be some truth to it, but it's misleading. You know what I mean? Just think of them very similarly. False light and defamation, just know that false light doesn't have to be entirely false. It's just casting someone in a false light. It's exactly what it sounds like. Yeah, you say that, you know, Andrew talks so fast that no one can understand him. Like, I don't know. I do talk fast, but I think people can understand me, right? Like, maybe that's a false light. It is true that I talk fast, but I feel like kind of being a little hard on me. Okay. Anyway, yeah, people ask me if they can watch my videos in 2X and 3X. I'm like, sure, good luck. So uh, negligence. Negligence. Yeah, sorry, Chelsea, sure is a little bad. Um, negligence is like the most heavily tested thing on, on torts. Um, Significance of polygraph is zone of danger versus foreseeable plaintiff, right? These are talking about foreseeability. Torch is all about, or negligence is all about the reasonably prudent person under similarly situated circumstances, how would they be held to act? And we got to think about, you know, someone was damaged by the negligence of someone, but was it foreseeable they would be damaged by it? Or were they in the zone of danger to be damaged by it? Negligence is duty, breach, causation, um, and damages. We need to have the actual and proximate. Actuals, but for proxima is a foreseeable plaintiff. Um, duty is a big one. In general, the best defense you have on the MBE for torts is there was no duty. They didn't owe a duty to this person. That's the strongest defense you could ever make on a, on a torts question. I always bring this one up because when I took the California MBE, I spent more time on this question than any question in history, which was a skier. An amateur skier caused an accident on a ski slope. Will he be held to the duty of care? of a normally prudent skier or normally prudent amateur skier. And I stared at him like, what is the difference? And there is a key difference. He will be held to the standard of care as a normally prudent skier because you do not get a lower standard of care for being an amateur. But if the question said an expert skier causes an accident on the mountain, what standard of care will be held to an expert skier or a skier? The answer is an expert skier. That's a distinction that they do test. They can, well, they have tested that you will get a heightened duty of care if you're an expert in something, but you will not get a lower duty of care if you're an amateur. Um, duties, you know, if you're a child, you'll be held to the same standard as an ordinarily prudent child like you, right? <laughs> People are making fun of me. I'm not going to say what I said the last time, but if you're a 12 year old kid and you could read, then you're smart and you could read the no trespassing sign. If you're a six-year-old kid who is blind, you know, who is visually impaired, you probably can't read the sign, you know? Look at the fact patterns. The MBE, especially in torts, they make it very clear of like who they are and what their capabilities are. If they're a doctor, national standard of care. Most other people, tutor, regional standard of care. Okay, under what specific circumstances are an affirmative duty to act? Parent, child, doctor, patient, patron, business, guest, innkeeper, common carrier, husband, wife, fiduciary relationships, 
creations of peril if you're the rescuing one, or if you create the peril and you have a duty to rescue. I mean, these aren't always, you don't always have an affirmative duty to act. These are just situations where there potentially could be an affirmative duty to act. Usually when in doubt, we don't have a duty in society to be a hero, right? When in doubt, you just have a duty to not be a, I don't know who the person I was gonna name, but you don't have a duty to just not be a horrible person, not be a bad guy, not be someone who causes harms to other. You just have a duty to be okay, to be decent. Um, do psychologists ever have a duty to warn third persons of statements made by their clients? Yes, when they are threatening to cause imminent harm or crimes, when it's like, I'm gonna shoot the president tomorrow. Whoa, I gotta do that. I gotta tell people that's, that's crazy. Are you sure you're gonna shoot him? Yeah, okay, sorry to snitch on you here, but I have to, right? Think about that, your professional duty. Lawyers have the same duties. You all should know that. If your client says they're gonna do something wild, you're gonna actually have to breach your duty of confidentiality. Um, wild, I mean, to commit a crime or in furtherance of crime or something of that nature. Where's the, um, that's a good question, Isa. Does anyone know the answer to that? I had an adapt bar question about that and I, I got it wrong, so I wasn't sure. It said that if they're threatening to commit suicide, the psychologist didn't have a duty to warn the parents, but it was very confusing. Okay, I don't remember that exact question and let's bring it up. Whoever finds that question, bring it up and, and bring it to my attention in, the, in my Telegram chat because I don't want to give people false information. I don't know. I'll look for it and I'll let you know. All right, cool. That's a good question though. I want everyone to be experts of this stuff. That's an interesting thought. Does a psychologist have a duty to tell the parents if they, you know, if the kid and he's a minor or an adult? That's, that's an interesting question. Let's see that. All right, let's move forward though. What is a reasonable person standard where ordinarily prudent person would do, be asked to do under similarly situated circumstances? Got that. What standards adult with mental disability held to? What about an adult with a physical disability? If you have a physical disability, you have a lower standard of care or equal to another with a disability, such as blindness. A mental disability, this is what Matt was saying, and Matt got uh, the highest score I've ever heard on the MBE, so I'm taking his word for it. He said that if you have a mental disability, you don't receive a lower standard of care. And the way I rationalize that is it's like, yeah, because then people could be like, oh, I'm dumber. You know, it's hard to kind of like say mental, you know, to draw the line. I mean, if it's like a severe uh, mental disability, you'll be held to the standard of care of someone probably with that severe mental disability. But if I think it's just like a lower IQ, you're not going to get a lower standard of care. Um, what standard of children held to? Under which circumstances are they held to the standard of reasonable adult? The answer is when doing an adult-like activity. So if they're driving the car or the motorcycle or the boat, the child will be held to the adult-like standard of care. Otherwise, as I said earlier, they're just held to a child of similar age, intellect, experience, and circumstances. Professionals and regional standard, we're regional standard for most professions. Actual is the but-for cause, but-for the negligence, proximate is foreseeability. I wanna stop on this one for a second. Nowhere like the MBE is it foreseeable. It is foreseeable that if you get in a car accident with Tommy and break Tommy's ankle, now Tommy's on crutches, and then Tommy uses his crutch and slips on a banana peel. And when he slips in the grocery store, he hurts his shoulder. The driver who hurt his ankle will be responsible for the injury to his shoulder because it is foreseeable that someone on crutches will slip on a banana, right? And break their shoulder. From my experience on the MBE, most things are foreseeable. In order to truly cut off the chain of foreseeability, it has to be some superseding event that is just totally intentional and criminal. There's even a question on the MBE, well, an old MBE, where, and when I say on the MBE, I mean previous MBE practice questions, or questions, disclosed questions. There's a question that I've seen where some contractor leaves a ladder next to a window, right? Goes home. Well, Robbie the robber walks by and says, ooh, open window, ladder, opportunity of a lifetime. Walks up the ladder, goes in the window, steals the jewelry. Is Cameron, the contractor, responsible for the theft of the jewelry? The answer there is yes, because you invited the thievery by doing such a, you know, invitational type of ladder window thing, you invited it. That to me is like very closely drawing the line because usually 
the crimes of another, the intentional tort of another will be a superseding event that cuts off liability. But in that particular question, they said that because, you know, you basically gave the guy an alley you, you know, it, you could be responsible. Um, what constitutes an intervening cause? So again, we talked about intervening versus superseding. Intervening will not relieve liability from the original tort feeser. Like that would be intervening right there. Superseding will relieve liability from the original tort feeser. Something like doing a criminal act. And I kind of drew the line there. A criminal act doesn't always constitute a superseding uh, cause, but it is a good way of thinking that it is a superseding cause. One thing I can't stress enough is when you're doing these questions, I've gotten to the point with torts where, you know, I'm, I'm confident with them. Read all four answers. A lot of times D is yes, if the court determines that a reasonable, you know what I'm saying? A lot of times one of the answers is like, A looked like the best answer, but if you read D, it gives you new facts that would make D, oh, well, yeah, that's more reasonable. You know, when in doubt, you're looking for the most reasonable way of resolving the circumstance. Another thing that was uh, I, I approached with a student talking about torts was we haven't gotten a civil procedure yet, but you've already started seeing summary judgment and directed verdict, right? They'll say, should the court grant a summary judgment or directed verdict? What that means, let's start with summary judgment, is that there's no genuine issue of material fact, meaning everything you say is true. I still, that doesn't constitute any tort or any crime. You know, there's not, there's no case here. Like I'm not denying what you're alleging. I'm just saying that I'm not liable for anything, even if that all is true. So then you're looking for an answer that maybe says, you know, the court may uh, determine negligence here based on these facts, the court can infer negligence. One example is, where's it? Where else? Um, one example is guys walking on the shoulder of the highway. Driver hits him, right? There's no video. There's nothing. There's only a statute that says, you know, you can't walk on the shoulder of a highway. Um, so with those facts presented, should they grant summary judgment for the driver of the car? The answer is no, because a reasonable jury could conclude that the driver of the car was negligent, right? Maybe you're not supposed to drive on the shoulder of the highway. Maybe you're not, you know, if there's, a, if there's a reason for the judge, for the jury, I'm sorry, to get together and consider you know, what the, who's responsible or what the ultimate um, decision is, then we're not going to grant summary judgment or directed verdict. Summary judgment directed verdict is granted when there's no issue, even if all the facts are true. Okay. What is negligence per se? Here we're talking about statutory negligence. There's a statute on point that says that if you do this, you're negligent. A speed limit is a great example or a parking uh, meter or not parking meter, or like a no parking by fire hydrant. It could also be a criminal statute. There's a question that says, you know, you need to have a sprinkler in your, in your warehouse. And then something burns down because there's no sprinkler. Can you sue for negligence? Yes, because you didn't have the sprinkler as mandated by the statute. Even though it's a criminal statute, it still establishes a civil duty of care. Another example is, uh, I talked about this like nine times since like the last week, but 10, 10 can't hurt. Um, Sammy the Swerver, right? If Sammy the Swerver is driving his car and a guy is parked next to a fire hydrant, well, there's a statute that says you can't park next to the fire hydrant. Sammy the Swerver swerves, he hits Tommy next to the fire hydrant. Now Sammy says, hey, Tommy, you violated your duty of care. You're parked next to the fire hydrant. You know, I win the case. No, because it's designed injury protective class. The purpose of that statute is so that people firefighters who are trying to access the fire hydrant um, can do it. It's not so that Sammy the Swerver cannot um, um, hit a car. So, so make sure you look at that. Is it design injury and protected class? Is who is meant to be protected by the statute really being protected? Okay. Are there any exceptions to the negligence per se rule? Unforeseeable, uncontrolled event cause you to violate the statute. So there's a question I remember where a guy's driving, he has an unforeseeable heart attack, unforeseeable heart attack, causes him to swerve into the other lane. The statute says, as you drive in the other lane, you're negligent, cause the accident. Not liable for negligence per se, because the unforeseeable, uncontrollable heart attack was what caused him to violate the statute. Ray Sips loquitur, the thing speaks for itself. The examples are, you know, the pot falls from the, the um, 
balcony and it's your balcony, it's my balcony, and you know it's my balcony, I have exclusive control over my balcony, well, then the pot falling is my fault. Now, if we're having a party, you know, the Gatsby party, and we're all on the balcony, you know, doing our thing, and uh, a drink falls off and hits someone in the head, can you sue everyone because we were all up there under race IPSA? No, you have to prove that somebody, you know, was responsible. You can't just say because you were all, you know, up there and the thing speaks for itself. One of you must did it. You all owe me 1% of it. You know, no, you have to have exclusive control. The other good example of race IPSA loquitur that I like to use is the scapula that's left in the person's organ. If you are a doctor and your team does a surgery, you leave the scapula in the organ, can you recover over race ipsa loquitur? Absolutely. How else would a scapula have gotten in the organ? And the, the scapula and my organs were under your exclusive control, the doctor and his team. It's your fault, race ipsa loquitur. The thing speaks for itself. Um, any questions so far about these first things with negligence? Preguntas? Nothing? Any jokes? Um, what duty is owed to known trespassers, unknown trespassers, guests, business invitees? So let's start from the heightened duty, you business invitees, people who confer a business relationship. If you're there to shop for shoes, you have to do reasonable sweeps of the property. Rosie's being a nuisance. Um, when you own a store, you have to do reasonable sweeps to make sure that, you know, people aren't, aren't falling or whatever. In the MBE world, the world is covered in bananas. Just get that, accept that. It's covered in bananas. And be very careful about the condition of this banana. If the banana falls on the floor and it is unpruned, there's no duty to sweep it because it just fell. If the ice is on the floor and it's unmelted, there's no duty to sweep it because it just went there. If the ice is melted, it's been there for a while. If the banana is pruned, it's been there for a while and they likely had a reasonable duty to sweep. Guests are, you know, social guests come over to my house, come to my graduation party. You have a duty to warn of non-open and obvious harms. The known trespasser, you have a higher duty than an unknown trespasser. If you know people cross your property and you shoot guns into the yard and you hit one of them, come on. You knew people cross your property, you shot the gun, you hit someone, you're liable. Unknown, if you're shooting and you don't know people cross, you, know, you hit someone, it's not your fault. You just, there's one question in particular I remember that's like, um, there's a, a big shock, an electric shock, because you have like a trap in your driveway. That's not okay, because you made it to, uh, to harm someone, right? Um, attractive nuisance, broken trampolines. So you all had the pleasure of meeting Alexis. You, some of you met Sam. I think she came to my Florida course. And we do this. Next week, I'll, I'll, we'll start it off. But we make... Uh, album covers you get you have to make a rapper name or country singer name or whatever is your jam and an album and sam she killed it her uh her diva name was attractive nuisance she's playing a halftime show and her album was broken trampolines and she killed it and that's just a great visual you know there's a book that i highly recommend if you could have read it three months ago called um uh moonwalking with einstein and it talks about memorization and i'll save you the, the having to read it it comes down to this. The way to memorize things is to visualize it. If you could see a tract of nuisance and a sea of broken trampoline, that's a better way of memorizing it than being like, an attractive nuisance is when one place is, a, you know what I mean? The visualization is the key to memorization. Try to create visual associates with everything you know. Attractive nuisance, you should see a broken trampoline, right? Um, business invitees, you should see a banana on the floor and be thinking if it's, if it's pruned or not. I really hope that that... Uh, is resonating with people because that I read the whole book and that's what he gets at. This guy went from knowing nothing about memory to getting sixth place in the world in the not in the world memory championships where they gave him six deck of cards and he looked at it for five minutes and then you have to memorize every single card and it's a learned skill. It's not something that you're born with. It was a really really cool book. Proof point is you can do it. Just try to visualize what you remember. Okay, on the MBE if they tell you. Uh, nothing we're going to assume pure comparative negligence and joint and several liability how do you know that on the front page of the book you open it up it says assume pure comparative negligence and joint and several liability here 
Pure comparative negligence means even if I'm 80%, 99% liable, I can still recover for the other 20% or 1%. Anyone can recover if they're damaged, right? Under partial or modified comparative negligence, and they tell you that, that means if you're over 50% at fault, then you're barred from recovery. You cannot recover. And then if it's contributory negligence, that means that if you're at fault at all, then you cannot recover. And then Matt was telling us about this. And I have seen this question. This is a tough question. This may implicate the last clear chance rule. The last person who had the chance to not be negligent is at fault. So if they talk about the last clear chance rule is in effect, that's what that means. The last person with a chance to not be negligent is at fault. That's a tough thing to understand. Don't get lost in that sauce. Just make sure you understand pure comparative negligence, meaning that 80% at fault, you can recover 20%. The way they usually do it is pure comparative negligence and joint and several liability. A, B, and C are in a car accident. A, they're all 33% at fault. What can A recover from B? Can anyone tell me if I don't give you any more facts on the MBE? A, B, and C are in a car accident. They're all 33% at fault. What can A recover from B? All of them. Which is how much? 66. 66, not 100. Because he's 33% at fault. How could he recover? You know, he can't self-recover, but you can recover the rest of it. 100% of the remaining 66.666%. Right, and you're technically wrong. It's 66.6. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it's uh, 66%, right? And that's a key concept. Now, what would happen? That doesn't seem fair. Well, B would have to get that 33% from C in either a uh, contribution or some sort of indemnity action, right? But that's what joint several liability means, that the plaintiff can recover the entire amount, which is 100% minus what percent they're at fault from any singular defendant. Um, okay. If it has abolished joint several liability, then you can only get the percentage that that person is at fault. Right. And then they can't get anything. If it's A, B, and C, we're all 33% at fault. They've abolished joint several liability. Then A can get 33% from B and A can get 33% from C. Nothing more, nothing less. But usually pure comparative negligence, um, joint several liability, meaning even if I'm 80% at fault and B and C are 10% at fault each, I can get 20% from B. I hope that makes sense with everyone. Um, when is a plaintiff deemed to have assumed the risk of negligent conduct? Like if you're playing a sport, you assume the risk of negligent conduct, but not intentional conduct, right? There's one with the race, the, 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 um, what are they called? Jockeys and they're, they're riding a horse. And, you know, they say, what if true would give rise to battery? And it's if he intended to ram the other horse, like that's not part of, uh, horse racing. The Kentucky Derby was pretty deadly this year from what I remember, but that was not part of horse racing, right? You're not allowed to like, just ram into someone that's battery boxing you do consent, you know, there's punching in boxing. You got to look at the sport. You know, there's a question that says they're playing basketball and they're throwing boats, they're throwing elbows. What's the best defense for getting caught with an elbow? It's not that you uh, consented to violent play. It's that the elbow exceeded or didn't exceed the level of play that you had, um, you had established. Consenting to violent play is too strong on that particular question. Uh, let's see. Um, what are the elements of NIED and all these different types of negligence? We basically just said, remember with negligence, it's doing something stupid. You know, you shouldn't have trusted, you know, um, Sammy the Steeler with watching over the funds. You know, the mom, you should have been watching your kid when he's known to be doing bad things. Like, these are pretty fair. Negligence is just doing something stupid. NIED, negligent infliction of emotional distress, intentionally outrageous act that causes physical harm. Um, so remember, with IIED, you don't actually need physical harm. It could be just you know mental anguish. With NIED, you usually want to show physical harm. And then another big thing about NIED is the bystander claim. And the answer to the bystander claim is always in the zone of danger, right? Um, someone who, what's their best reason? They're in the zone of danger when they saw it. That's so they can recover for an NIED claim, for a bystander NIED claim. Um, any questions about negligence? Just who did something stupid? Look, take a step back and be like, wait a minute. If this happened, who's the idiot here? That's the person who's responsible. It's as simple as that. I love negligence questions because you don't actually need to know anything. 
I think of all the topics on the bar exam, this is the one section where I could just give it to someone who never studied the law and they would be able to pick a lot of right answers. Cause it's just like, who's liable here? This guy, you know, the guy who, who didn't read, who, the guy who ignored the warning sign and got hit by the thing. It's his fault because he ignored the warning sign. It doesn't take, you know, a master of law to understand negligence. All right, we have strict liability and prox liability. Remember, there's three things for strict liability, wild animals, inherently dangerous activities, and prox liability. We just did a question with a student and she, he, it, whoever, was a little bit confused because it was a defanged snake. Who cares if it's a defanged snake? It's a wild animal. So if that snake chases someone away and they get injured, the reason that they're liable is not because it was reasonably foreseeable that the defanged snake would chase them. It's because they got injured by a snake, because it's strict liability. You don't have to prove any of these other factors. It's just they got injured, strict liability, wild animals. Snake is a, is a great one. The dog or the cat is going to be domesticated. Um, so uh, what about a farm animal and a wild animal? So domesticated, you know, if you have knowledge of their dangerous propensities, then you could have an uh, argument for strict liability. But usually with the dog, the answer is um, more of a negligence thing that you should have known. Um, and then the farm animal, animal it's uh, pretty much the same as domesticated, um, unless you, know, you should have known that the farm animal has been dangerous or it's for eating crops or something. Okay, we've abolished the one bite rule, one free bite rule in most jurisdictions, which means that you can be held liable for your dog, even if it's their first time biting someone. Uh, what's the definition of abnormally dangerous activity? Can you think of some examples? Dynamite, chemicals like acid, nuclear waste, and sludge. Um, key thing here, you have to be injured by the dangerous uh, condition of the activity. So if there's toxic waste that spills out of a truck and then someone slips on it, I know this, the MBE is like Mario Kart. You're just slipping on sludge and bananas everywhere. But if you slip on the sludge, that's not strict liability, right? Because it's not that you inhaled the dangerous toxicity, it's you slipped on it. It has to be the toxicity that's going, or the chemical nature of it, or the dynamite nature of it, that, uh, that is going to uh, give rise to strict liability. Um, remember the question about the guy goes to, to check on the dynamite, he's a dynamite inspector, and the building blows up? You assume the risk there. That's the best argument. Your job, assume the risk of blowing up the dynamite. The elements of strict liability, so note if a strict product liability fails, the plaintiff can also sue under negligence. But for strict liability, we said a retail distributor, manufacturer, supplier placed a defective good in the stream of commerce that resulted in damages. It was defective when it left their control. Um, we get the defective design, defective manufacturer, failure to warn. Failure to warn could be express warranties or the implied warranties of merchantability or fitness for a particular purpose. Um, Here's a good question. This is a question everyone gets wrong. So if you got it wrong, join the, join the pack. There's an RV that blows up and it's a huge fire. It's the biggest fire the world's ever seen. Is that a strict liability case? The answer is no, because the damages are only to the RV itself, right? For, for products liability, it has to be damage to a person or other property. It can't just be the damage to the thing itself. So look out for that. Though, they love to give you these fact patterns that throw you off to think like, wow, it was a huge fire and it blew up into flames. But it's like, wait a minute. The, you know what's the proper remedy if your RV blows up? Does anyone know? Um, a refund? Yeah, a refund or a new RV, right? Not a whole strict liability case. It's just you get your money back. Thing didn't work. Okay. Who's considered a commercial supplier? Key. An auctioneer is not a commercial supplier. A third party middleman is not a commercial supplier. It's gotta be what I said up here, uh, manufacturer, retail distributor, et cetera. Manufacturing defect, design defect, how they differ. Manufacturing was designed okay, but one of them left the line differently than the others. You know, Tommy took a smoke break and didn't install the one thing on piece on widget 487, right? Widget 487 is different than the rest of them. That's going to be a manufacturing defect. A design defect is a thing was designed defectively. And how do you know if it was designed defectively? Consider the risk utility balancing test, right? Whether the risk of, uh, of that it created was greater or less than 
the utility of creating it that way. If it says there was a reasonably safe alternative that was cheaper, then it's going to fail the risk utility balancing test. Um, what are the elements of a commercial supplier's failure to warn? Express warranty, as we said, is warning labels and the implied warranties of fitness for a particular purpose and merchantability. Merchantability, the thing turns on, it works. Fitness for a particular purpose is like, you know, this driver works to hit the ball 300 yards if you get good contact, you know, like it's for what they said it would work for. Um, so liability generally in Hanara, um, eggshell plaintiff rule, you take the plaintiff as they come. If they have a glass jaw and you punch them and their jaw shatter, shatters, their jaw shatters, then you're going to be liable for the entirety of the shattered jaw. One question on the MBE, you tap someone on the bus. Hey, Susie, this is your stop. Is that battery? No, because they have consented to the normal touchings of everyday life. Vicarious liability and responding superior, that's a third party liability. Um, and uh, we can see it potentially in adults and children, but that's rarely only if they're like an infant. Usually with adults and children, it would be a, a negligent supervision claim. Vicarious liability is going to be employer, employee, respondent superior. On the MBE from torts, as a general matter, of course, I tend to decide that both parties are liable, the homeowner and the contractor. There's usually a reason why they're both liable. Either it was under his direction or it was an abnormally dangerous activity, or there's one where it was trespass. The, the, the homeowner told Tommy, the tree planter, to plant the trees there, and it was on um, Johnny's property. Is that trespass, and who's liable? And the answer is both of them, because you know the homeowner pointed that, and the tree planter actually did the act, so they're both liable. So that's not a bright line rule. I know some instructors like to give you these like general bright line rules, you can always apply. That is never the case. You have to read every single question and consider it. But just in my experience, if you're on the fence of is only one person liable or are they both liable, I found that they tend to both be liable more often. Just a, a thought from my experience. Um, Quick question. Yeah. So when you bring a claim for respondent superior, like, do you name the issue as a respondent superior issue or vicarious liability issue? Well, this is MBE. I think you're talking about essays, but in general, I, if I was essays, start from the top. You know, the issue is vicarious liability, which is when one party can be held liable for the acts of the other. In particular here, um, the type of vicarious liability is respondent superior, which is vicarious liability and employer-employee relationship, la, 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 la. Just as a general sense in essays, get more points than possible. But on MBE, you know, you should definitely know this word, um, employer, employee, uh, um, liability. Now we have to consider the frolic versus the detour. The frolic is what it sounds like it is. There's a, there's a meme or a video on Instagram. It's like, oh, we're frolicking today. Like, yeah, we're frolicking. And it's a bunch of guys like frolicking in the field, like literally jumping up, like grown men. That's what frolicking is. You go off to meet up with your girlfriend and do drugs and do all sorts of terrible things that you should never do on the clock. A detour is you, you go pick up a cup of coffee or something, you know, it's, it's, it's part of your job. It's within the scope of business. The detour, you will be liable. The spine superior, you know, vicarious liability will apply for the detour. For the frolic, no, because you totally went out. The frolic is like a superseding event that'll cut off the liability. Um, outside the scope of employment, we said crimes and intentional torts and illegalities, but I did say uh, an exception is if the intentional tort is part of your job, like a bouncer. It's part of his job to beat people up, you know? That's, you could potentially be liable under respondent superior for how he handles his job if it's beating people up. What's the difference between an employee and an independent contractor? How can you tell the difference in a fact pattern? The difference is control, how long they work, how many hours per week, what their contract says, equipment, freedom to set hours. If the guy pulls up with a company logo, the company can be liable, right? That's what I said for vicarious liability. If he pulls up with the, you know, he's an independent contractor, but he has the company logo, then you can have some agent theory, you know? Um, they might tell you he's an independent contractor, but if the facts state that they're really an employee, then they're technically an employee, and that's in law too. Um, what is the principles in law? This is all. What is the principles, I mean, in the real world of law? What is the principles liability for acts by an independent contractor? Almost always there's none unless there's negligent hiring, no background check, negligent instruction, negligent supervision. Some things are non-delegable. For example, a hotel owner 
or a mall owner to do repairs or public statute about sidewalks. So that's what I said, like in general, there's not liability for independent contractors, but I find on the MBE, there's typically one of these exceptions that makes liability attached. Just work on those questions and, and you know, give me feedback if you find that the same. Like I said, on contracts with parole evidence, we all know the rule about parole evidence, but on the test, it seems that the exceptions come in more often than, you know, it's contradicting the fully integrated document. All right, market share liability. Um, no, market share liability, Iona, can be tested on the MBE. She says that a UBE top topic. It can be tested. It's a theory that you should know. I'll just quickly go over it. It's products liability. If you can't determine exactly who manufactured it, but five different companies all manufactured the same thing, and you could show that it's fungible, which means that they're all the same, then you could assign liability like Merck, and Pfizer, and Moderna all made product A, and I got sick, and we don't know who did it, but you know they're, they're all fungible. Merck made 80%, the other two made 10 and 10. We can assign liability that way. That's what you see with market share liability when it comes to... Um, Torts. You might also know the market participant theory when it comes to con law, and that's why this test is tough, and you got a lot of things to keep in mind, but not heavily tested. One question at most. Joint several liability. I already talked about this. You can recover the total amount from any one defendant. A can go after B if A is 33%, then A can get 66% from B, and then B would have to get the 33% from uh, the others. Um, right. When it says A can recover 100% from B and C, it means 100% of what he's not liable for. If he's 0% at fault, it's 100%. If he's 20% at fault or she, then it's 80% that they can recover from any single defendant. Indemnification, when one party claims it doesn't owe because another party owes and didn't participate in the injury but still liable. And then contribution, when one party requires another party to pay a portion of liability, they participate in part of the injury but not held liable for all of it. Um, only two more, don't worry. What's the doctrine of alternate, alternate liability? Alternate liability is when you're not exactly sure what caused it, not sure when, which bullet caused the injury, you could sue both of them. The burden shifts to prove they didn't shoot you. So alternate liability is, we think two people are liable. We don't know who is, but, and they could both be held liable unless one of them can prove that they didn't do it. The burden shifts. So you look for that with like the shooting at the gun range. And then punitive damages are to punish. So it's going to be intentionally willful one-time behavior. And the limit is, uh, there's usually a limit, maybe three times or 500,000. So this is a really intensive questionnaire. I think it's a great way to uh, make sure that you're on top of uh, your studies. You see, um, we did the uh, PowerPoint. Um, there's a QA and a in here. There's a cram guide in here. We did Jeopardy. There's a lot of materials that you could go over on your own, but nothing is going to be as instructive as when we go over and do questions on Sunday. And if you can't make it on Sunday or you want to get a, you know, a, almost like a cheat code, we did 51 questions in December. I think we did 48 out of 51. You can look through all those, the questions and the answers. I have no problem with people learning questions, memorizing answers, as long as that's just part of the process, because, you know, it's all learning and, and repetition is very important when it comes to learning. So, um, you know, we didn't go over the full outline today, but I thought what we did was instructive and uh, I think torch is going to be a subject that everyone should be looking forward to. It's very manageable.